So strategy into action, and we put it guerrilla style. Why guerrilla? Not many people have allocation of li unlimited resources that can just say, hey, we'll hire one product manager per, I don't know, per vertical, and we'll have like 20,000 product managers, and we all can dedicate ourselves just to one thing. That usually doesn't happen. What we tend to happen is that we do pretty much a little about anything, about much. So when we talk about guerrilla style, is how do you do it in a fast, in an agile, in a lean way, so you can actually use your time to, f to really strive on your product and really make it grow when you have so much to do? Because I have a lot of things to do. Don't you all? OK. So hopefully we'll dig into that. Let me grab this uh, here. And first, let me talk a little bit about myself. I'm from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is Central America, not Puerto Rico. Costa Rica, most happiest country in the world. Okay, the land of the Pura Vida, where everything's nice and sweet, and so am I. It's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> apart from that uh, Costa Rican sponsored ad, um, uh, I've been a product manager for over eight years and I'm the senior product manager at Idealista. I've worked in so many types of companies from Procter & Gamble, being this huge multi multinational company, from doing my own startup to being the first employee on a startup that raised uh, $1.5 million on Chile as well, and leaving that experience of just burning from <laughs> $1 million and saying, where's our product after $1 million? Uh, but also joining great companies like uh, Idealista that, ha that has such a name and um, such a place within the industry, and I guess. So GPS and, and navigation systems are based on satellites, and mostly 30 satellites that were put in place by the U.S. military. Okay? So there are 30 satellites, and when you have a GPS-enabled device like your phone, if you have at least three satellites in place, there's a process, a mathematical formula, that can determine your precise location. And if you have more than three satellites, then it's more accurate. That's when you get on, on WhatsApp and you send your location. It says uh, approximately, I don't, know, I don't know, a thousand meters, and then goes down and down and down and down and down. That means it's acquiring more satellites to get a more precise location. So these satellites allows us to not only know our location, but also to develop apps like cycling apps, running apps, like Waze, like Google Maps, that not only can tell us where we came from, but where we are right now, but most importantly, if we are heading to the right direction. And, and basically, um, this is strategy for us. However, we were, we were all saying that we have a lot of things to do. So sometimes you go and you write your stories, you put in place your MVP, you put it out there, you go back, you try to learn, you look at your data, you go back, you learn, you put, and you all know that cycle, and I'm not going into that. But I, I usually, and, and before I got into this method, I usually felt like this. I don't know if you have, but you keep on working, and sometimes you get like your head stuck in the ground. You're so deep into your, your scrums and your dailies and your everything, and you, you can't see, go, go back and see actually the forest, like they say. You're, you're all, all the time, you're looking at the trees. And it's really difficult for us to really step back. But it's actually our job to be taking that step back and being able to see if, if what you're doing is really good for you or not. And many people, and, and when I tell good for you, is for your product, of course. <laughs> and many people talk about roadmaps. And I'm not going to be the first one here saying that roadmaps suck. It, it's not about that. It's that roadmaps itself, and as has happened to me, take a lot of time to build. It take a lot of time, and you often end up questioning your, your own life and your own life choices, and why did I, when I'm a product manager, I'm gonna stop doing this, and I've spent so many time, and I can't finish my roadmap, and, it, and sometimes roadmaps as they are, and there's a lot of books out there, tend to be a lot, tend to require too much investment for ourselves, and they are a really helpful tool, but we're talking about guerrilla here. We're talking about doing things fast and lean. 
So I'm going to be proposing a little framework for you all that you can use on your products or even in your features. Because sometimes for your products, you can, you can lay out an entire roadmap and it'll be great. But sometimes even for critical features that are like sort of a product on itself, you don't want to you don't want to invest that much time into creating a roadmap. So how do you lay out a strategy for it? How do you define that? And this this is where the fun begins for our for our conversation. This is what I'm going to be talking about you today. We're going to be talking about how to construct a base strategy, how to how to lay it out with a simple framework I'm come to to share with you guys. But also, and most importantly, the conversation on the strategy was about validating this into action, and that was the whole purpose of the, uh, of, the tr of the talk itself as well. And also, after you have ended up not only creating your strategy, but validating it with action, then what happens next? So hopefully it's going to be a really practical thing, and hopefully you can, you can learn something from it. And we're going to start by acquiring the signal. So we're trying to look our GPSs to understand where we are right now. And how is that base strategy going to look like? I found this quote today after researching for, for, for this presentation, and it really struck me. And I just want to lay it out there because it's really important, and it, it does make a lot of sense to what I'm going to show you. Like 80% of our time should be based on planning. Ourselves is planning. I laugh a lot when I, when I remember one thing that one coworker had on, on his desk that said, like, my grandmother only knows that I work on the internet. And in Spanish, it said internet, which was funnier. Uh, and it was true. When I try to explain to my grandparents what I do, sometimes I just end up saying, like, uh, tita, how, how I call it, uh, I, I'm... I'm I'm being paid to think. And, and that's actually true. Our, our, plan, our, our jobs as product managers is to actually think and be able to put the thinking into a plan and being able to execute it. So going back into strategy before starting all, just let's go back to thinking, OK, we're, we're thinking. But what are we thinking about? We're, we're thinking about a strategy. And what, what is a strategy? It's basic, basically a plan. You have your destination. You need to lay out a plan in order to, to get there. So here's our base strategy. That, that's it. That, that's, that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs> it's just four questions. Anyone can do four questions. We're talking about why we're doing this. Where do you want to go? How do we get there? And how do we know if we are there? That's basically my presentation, as I said it, as simple as that. If you can answer those questions for your products or your base experiences, you'll be able to lay it out in a strategy for them and follow it through. How? Why are we doing this? Please, don't, don't work on things that you don't understand why you're doing it. I was thinking the other day about, about KPIs for the presentation. And I was thinking, what could be a great KPI for product managers, for ourselves? Does someone have uh, an idea? What could be a great KPI for product managers? No? I have one. How many, questions, how many times do you ask why every week? Why? If you're not asking why constantly, you're not doing your work. Because our work is asking why. Why are we doing this? Because blah, blah. And why is blah, blah important? We need to understand why are we doing stuff in order for us to really put our strategy into action and being able to actually execute on the why. And why is basically the context. In business, we'll call it, is, is it an opportunity? Is there something in the market that needs to be addressed? Is there a pain on our users that we need to solve? And it's, and it's not that you're going to be writing a whole page about this, and we'll see an example about this. It's just take the time to write 
two lines, I dare you, on why are you doing what you're doing. It's hard. It's really hard. When you get and you put things on paper, your, your mindset goes into a really place where you need to tell a story. You need to tell why you're doing this to convince yourself, but also your team that what you're doing is important. So write some lines and ask yourself and answer yourself and your teammates why you're doing what you're doing, why your product is doing what it is doing. And it is followed by a second question. We have a context. We have a business opportunity. We have a pain in the user. We wrote that down in the previous uh, question. This is the second question. Where do we want to go? And this is easily explained as the vision of a product. You're all aware what the vision is, right? It's a statement that tells you how are you going to be looking, how your solution is going to be looking for that problem that you were talking previously. Okay, so we talk about the problem. Now we're saying, how do we want to solve that problem? Again, just write two lines on your products on how your product is going to look like. How it needs to look like in order to solve the pain you just described. Third question. How do we get there? If you want to go, let's say, if you're hungry for paella, and you want to have the best paella, you obviously know and think about Valencia, right? So if we want to go to Valencia, we have several options, right? We, have, we can take our car, we can take the bus, we can take blah, blah, car, we can take the ave, we can take a plane, we can walk, we can cycle. But what's the best option for our products? We need to define the action points that are going to be taking us there. So we're going to take a flight, we're going to go to the airport, then we're going to take a bus. After the bus, we're going to go to the beach. And in the beach, we'll find a nice restaurant and we'll, we'll have a very delightful uh, paella. So how do we get there are the actions. In product management, we'll call it themes. What are the themes that we need to put in place to work on those solutions that will take us where we want to take our products? Okay. But we also need to know if we're heading the right direction. It's not just going to Valencia. If we take, and sorry about the Spanish geography, as I say, I'm from Costa Rica, but if you go north, you're not heading into Valencia, right? So if you're north, your GPS will say, recalculando, or something like that. And you'll, t you'll know that you're going the wrong place. So you can, you can change directions and go head into the right place. So answering how do we know we're there are what we'll call the KPIs or the, or the KRs from OKRs. What are those indicators that can tell us if we're going or we're heading into the right direction? As simple as that. So are the KPIs. So now we're going to do an example. As I told you, this is, I, I hope this is a really practical uh, presentation for you all. I'm going to bring a new product for you all. It's called Dog Fleet. Nobody, nobody, nobody catch the name? It's like dog and athlete. So you have like dog fleet. I, I really, I, I, I made it up myself. Come on. It's, it's really good. <laughs> it's, it's just really good. <laughs> so, let's imagine dogs, and I really love those kind of dogs, but my wife won't let me have one. I really love Frenchies. Um, <laughs> let's imagine dogs can talk, and dogs like to exercise. They do. <laughs> uh, and let's pretend, because they do, that they want to brag with, the, with other dogs. Not only they want to work out, but also they want to be able to brag with other friends. I ran two kilometers on the beach, and it was in Valencia, having dog paella. That'll be a fun scene. So let's answer those questions with Dog Fleet, the greatest name for an app. Please don't steal this. I'm going to be putting this everywhere. <laughs> so we take the time, and I took the time to define what is the problem that Dog Fleet is going to be addressing. And the problem is 
that dogs like to exercise, as I told you before. I was selling you. You didn't think I was selling you my app, but I was selling you my app. Dogs like to exercise, and they like to brag within themselves. But you, you know what's most important? That there's no app for dogs. Dogs cannot start to run and, I don't know, push something and start to track their, their workouts. There's no app where they can post their picture eating the, the paella and tell you, like, hey, I ran 2K and I'm eating paella. Take that. So there's the business opportunity. There's something in the market that hasn't been addressed. There's a niche there. There's something that we need to tackle. There's a, a necessity, uh, we'll, we can call it. Dogs need this. It's clear what, why we're doing dog lead, right? Does anybody have any doubt on the problem? Nope. You can raise your hand, don't worry. Uh, I won't make fun. Why nobody's raising their hands? Because it's simple. The answer is really simple. Dogs like to exercise. They don't currently have a way of tracking their daily workouts, so they cannot know their fitness levels or their performance. They don't have a social network where they can brag, so, and nobody is doing that. It's really clear. I just talked to you about the greatest app here, and you all understand why we're doing what we're doing. So where do we want to go? And it, it took some time to define what, where, where I wanted to take Dothly. But we want to build the most engaging platform of dog athletes in the world. We want to help them share and record their, their workouts so they can also socialize or brag with other dogs. Have I talked about features here? Have I mentioned a single story over here? No, right? I'm not talking about the solution itself. I'm not talking about how to implement itself. I'm not messing about technology if it's iOS or Doc OS. But I'm defining where I want to take this solution. Does somebody doesn't understand what Doc Fleet is going to do? Point made. How do we get there? We need to improve the accuracy of our tracking system because we already launched. We want to develop social network features because maybe we only have a like and we know that social uh, network, networking is really important. But also what we want to integrate with top hardware dog health vendors. And also to integrate a great onboarding experience so dogs can start and they can enjoy the place and really understand how are the mechanics of the apps and have a great user experience. Remember, this is our highway to Valencia as well. We have our GPSs, and they're telling us that this is how do we know that we are there or that we're going into the right direction. But also, how do we know we're there? And these are going to be the KPIs that will guide our, um, our movement or our progress. In the case of, of Duck Fleet, we're going to be talking about signups. So 10% signups every month. We want to sustain churn below 5%. But also, we want uh, dogs to at least record two uh, workouts a week. And our premium conversion, because of course we are a freemium model app, is going to be 5% a month. So, dog fleet strategy, all laid out in here. Four questions. Anybody of you? I dare that we can pick anybody from, from any of your companies. They're, they can read about Dogfleet and they'll instantly understand why we are doing what we're doing, what are we doing in order to solve it, how are we, be, are we, are we going to tackle this solution, and how are we going to be knowing about if we're heading into the right direction. Simple, right? I dare all of you after, ho hopefully tomorrow, ask yourself those questions. And they're hard questions. And how, how can you create those questions within your companies? The context, 
you have to have great knowledge of your industry. You have to be able to talk with other, uh, with other users and go out and do surveys and understand your industry through your stakeholders, through our business leaders, and really get the graphs to be able to write a sentence like that and that it makes sense for your product. But also, the vision, where are we heading, is sometimes the most difficult to create within a product because we all have different visions. So let me give you a tip that I, that I do for, for creating a vision. Criticizing is easy when you put me something in front. So if you're going to your stakeholder or your CEO or your CPO or whatever position it is, and you're telling me, hey, what's our vision? It's going to be a hard conversation. It's going to be a hard conversation. If you have multiple products, having the conversation about a vision is really hard. So let me tell you a tip. Write the first vision yourselves and send it over. And send it over by email. Why? Because if you put it by email, they'll have the time. They'll, don't, they'll, they'll have the time to answer. They won't have that pressure uh, of you staring like, give me the vision. But also, re replying by email is going to make them think on their answer. So what I do is that when I'm creating those visions, I usually send those to all the stakeholders that have interest on my product. I send it over even to the team itself, to the tech lead. I send it even to the UX. I compare all of those answers, and I try to match and do those changes because all of us are the team and we all need to understand where is the solution that we want to take. And it's easy for them to see that vision and to tell you, no, I, I don't think that's right. That should be X or should be Y. And you can just start cradling up and you'll have a vision or at least an initial vision for your products. It really helps sending over by, by email and asking for a reply by email as well. So now you have your strategy, and I'll, I'll go back to the four questions later. How do you know if you're en route to your destination? So we have our destination, we have our compass. How do you know if we're going the right direction? And I want to talk here about two things and two aspects of the research and the work that we do. And one is, uh, what is data? obviously, that, that we would use, but, but also uh, how we approach this with users. So we have a, and sorry for forgetting the word in English, <laughs> but you have a data in terms of, of being quantitative, meaning numbers, but also it's really important the part of qualitative, um, and I forgot the word in English. Um, quantifiable. quantifiable, great, thank you. Uh, so you need to look at those sides in order to really be able to see and understand if you're heading to the right direction. So I'm gonna be talking about three things here. Staying as close as possible with users. Like when I started being a product manager, I was all into data because I could do SQL queries and I could use, uh, I don't know, Mixpanel or Amplitude or whatever was in fashion at, at that time of the years and get a lot of data. And I thought about just data is gonna give me all the answers. And the answer is, is really no. If you get out of your saddle, if you talk with users, they'll give you more answers, better answers that you can even get with data. So get out of your saddle and, and talk with those users. We're going to be also talking about using data without drowning and also about creating alignment within the organization. When I first joined Idealista, I really didn't knew about anything about real estate business. Anything. I come from... My previous experience was logistics, and uh, prior to that, uh, I was doing data scraping, the uh, intelligent data scraping for a startup. Uh, so I really didn't know anything about, about real estate. How I was going to be able to work on a product that empowers professionals in the industry if I, if I didn't know their work. So I came up with this idea uh, that I called, and I, I'm not saying that I invented the wheel, but it's called the beta program. What I did is that I put a simple survey with Hotjar asking people if they want to participate 
in building our roadmap. If they want to share their opinions and if they want to give us feedback in order to improve. And I just put it out there. And I really like putting it in the tools just in case you don't know them. So we put this poll in Hotjar. Do you want to help us? Do you want to try and talk about Idealista tools, which is our tool for our professionals? And a lot of people sign up. A lot of people. So a lot of people receive this email, which is basically Hotjar connected to MailChimp. And MailChimp sent it over the, this thank you email saying, hey, thank you for joining. Uh, we'll be in touch. We'll try to, know, uh, to not send uh, too much your way, but we'll probably be uh, once a month sending you stuff for you to see and get involved and be part of this community that's going to be helping us grow this tool for you guys. What I didn't knew at the time is the impact that this program would have on our users and in our feedback. So what do we do with this, this beta program? Anytime that we have a really cool feature that we are exploring or we have a great design or experience that we want to try out, we send it over through email. As simple as that. Just, hey, we're working on this feature. You want to check it out? Just go to the survey, we'll have the, the image over there, and give, your, uh, and give us your feedback. What, what do you think about it? And the first time we send it, we were like, is, is anybody gonna, gonna reply? <laughs> and actually, the, the results were incredible. One of the things that I learned through this experience is that people really wanna talk. People really want to engage with you. People want to share their own experiences and beliefs in order for a tool that they they're using to be improved for their own work. So we have took the advantage of this, of this program and just keep them sharing once a month, two times a month, sharing screenshots, sharing mockups, or even sharing a beta entry to some of the features that, that we want to try it out. It has proven really successful for us in order to get quick feedback because our open rate for these emails is about 60, 65% open rate. That's a really, really, really high figure for emails. And we get a lot of traction and a lot of engagement throughout this. And not only that, but we also uh, put this in, a, in, 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 our, in our Jira as well, so we can remember those people that suggested and participated, so we can later put in touch with them and tell us, hey, remember what you told about, about this? We improved. Thank you. And people really enjoy and really uh, pride themselves on being able to give you their feedback and hopefully have them up in their products. So talk to people. Not only go out and talk with them, but also use tools that can easily enable you to send over those, those feedback. And they'll reply. They'll come back. A lot of people want to do this. But also, there's a lot of feedback that comes from the first line of defense from sales, from support. If you're not talking with them, you're really missing the big picture. So talk with them, talk with support, sit with them, learn about their, their pains on what the, what the customers are saying. With sales as well, why are they not closing the sales? What do, you, do they need? What are you hearing about this? They really have a lot of insights that either data or feedback from the users won't give you. I talk about uh, getting out of your saddle or your chair and actually visiting them on their workplace or on their site where they would use your products as well to actually understand how do they use them in order for you to know those insights on what could solve and what are the, those initiatives that can actually make you thrive on, on your app and grow it. And as I said, uh, beta testing as well. Maybe we can leave it uh, at the end. Thank you. R r write, do that. write it down. <laughs> then data. And uh, how do we know with data, actually, and not drown in data? We have a lot of data now. We have a mix panel. We have amplitude. We have our own databases. We have queries. We have reports. But it's usually a lot, a lot of data. When we talked about the strategy and the four questions, I mentioned the KPIs and just setting on a few KPIs. For me, five is just, even five is just going way too much for starters. 
But what I really like is to talk about the product dashboard. When we defined for dog bleeds before what were the KPIs that would tell us if we were heading to the right direction, were the monthly signups, the churn, the workouts, or the premium conversion. Let's say we're working out, we're developing our processes, we're putting out features, we're listening to our customers, and we see our product dashboard, and it looks like this. Can anybody tell me what would you tackle? What would you do? The numbers? The target? Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll have to answer your question now because you, you did it. <laughs> uh, but actually, those target, those numbers have to be defined by you, by your stakeholder, by your entire team, being able to identify that those actual targets are feasible for you. How do you do it is, is a whole other conversation. How do you find metrics? But at the end, that conversation should take place between you, between your stakeholders, between anybody that is involved and set um, objectives that are actually uh, achievable. It doesn't make sense just to say, we're going to be putting in 200% uh, of new signups. That, that doesn't make sense. Usually, you get a grip when we're working, what's that number and how it should look like. Maybe let's say that we're in 8% and we want to increase that. So we move our target up, not our KPI. Our KPI is al already telling us where do we want to go, but maybe our business wants us to take us with more customers. So we increase the target. So in this case, our premium conversion is 2% and our target is 5%. Would you go out and chase like moonshots or crazy features if your conversion has a problem? I don't know, but it makes you wonder. If you have your KPIs in red, you should stop and you should start working on putting them back in green because that means that we are heading in the wrong direction and we won't have paella. We're heading into, I don't know, Barcelona. That's nearby, but not our destination. So if those numbers are in red, and remember we defined simply those numbers before, we need to start working on having those green before moving elsewhere. In the long run, we were talking about having this in red and put it in, in green as well. So how does strategy puts out in the future? I was getting some cool pictures to put in my presentation, and I found this, and I was going, oh, yeah, Pokemon Go, GPS, and I put it out there. And it actually struck with me that having one hand and one GPS is not the message that I wanted to share with you all. We were talking about talking with your UX, talking with your tech lead, talking with your stakeholders. All of them can help you shape that vision it's not our job to define things as they are because we think they are as they are. But having people around you that can tell you and more insights, it gets a better perspective on the destination that you want to take and it'll, it'll lead you to a better destination. So strategy won't, shouldn't stay in a, in a silo. We as product managers need to be ambassadors of our products. And what do I mean by that? It's not only externally in talking about your product and making cool presentations with your users and stuff like that. But even most importantly, is talking within the company, what is our strategy? And because we have work on a simple framework that, that anyone can understand what we're doing, share that within the organization so everybody knows, everybody knows where we're, we're heading. And when people know that where were they, where they, they are heading, conversations are better because we understand the context. But also the efforts of the entire organization are going to be focusing on those metrics that you define, on those destinations that you all have defined. So the company itself is going to work towards a, a single goal. You can bet on risky on risky features and risky assumptions, on hypotheses, but do test them. But test them when you have your product dashboard in green. 
first be green on your product dashboards, on the KPIs that matter, before rushing into all those fancy features that you want to build. And strategy should be uh, reviewed periodically. There, there are a couple of things that we do here uh, that I do within the company that have really proven helpful for me. First of all, once uh, we, we work in, in, in trimesters, so when we, are, when we have those trimesters defined and those goals, when we're talking about strategy, I always set a meeting with my team, with my development team, with UX, with all the, the team that are involved to the company, and I show them our strategy. And I show them what are our goals, what's expected from us, and most importantly, why. Why are we building what we're building? Why are we going to be tackling these problems because we, why we have defined those? What, are, what is the context? What are those reasons that have uh, lead us into defining those goals? And what's expected from us? All, not only in terms of development, meaning delivery, but also in terms of the metrics that will be, uh, that will be reviewing. So remember how GPS satellites work. You need to find at least three in order for your GPS-enabled device to work. Find those satellites for your products. How do you find those satellites for your products? By defining a strategy. Please don't tell me your strategy is up there. Write it down. If you need a simple framework to write it down, ask yourself, why are we doing this? Where do we want to go? How do we get there? And how do we know we're there? Do that. Do that exercise. It's really simple. It'll take you a lot of time, but it'll make you question everything that you're doing, not only for your products, but also for your key features. This could be done for initiatives as well, or for, fe or for features as well. Then, when you have your strategy defined, create your own product dashboard. And don't drown on data. Really, it's really common, and it has happened to me before, when I try to look at so many numbers that at the end I don't really get knowledge. And that should be data. They'll, sh they'll give you access to knowledge, to discovery. So start with one, three, five KPIs and follow them and make them green. If they're always green, then maybe your targets are too low or maybe you're not actually looking on the right KPIs. But if you do, why don't you add another KPI and start following a new, a new goal for you or put your targets up and sharing what we were talking before, sharing your strategy is key to creating corporate alignment. And I'm not talking corporate in the sense of a huge company. Even startups can work with this model. You can share that strategy with them periodically so everybody knows why we're doing, what we're doing, and what are we doing to solve it. If everybody knows what they're working on and why are they working on, they'll work happily. They'll know their own purpose and they'll work towards the goals that have been defined by uh, all of you. So try to find your satellites. Ask yourselves four simple questions and hopefully you'll be able to know if you're heading to the right direction or not. Thank you. Um, so I had a question about your uh, beta, uh, beta program that you did. So it seemed like that you already had a relationship with the users, is that right? So was it that you were bring? did you have to go out and like, and find new users or were these existing product users? For my own case, we had users. So the product was launched, uh, they were using the the actual uh, app. Uh, so I really had a lot of active users in there. Uh, you can either, I've seen this implemented as well, not only on working, 
but also in landing pages or, or sign up pages. Like, hey, do you want to help us with, with this? I think Intercom does a great job as well on handling those recruitment processes. So really, it doesn't matter if they're acting or not. What is important is that you understand where they come from in terms that uh, when I asked them this, I uh, asked for their email. And because of their email, I was able to identify them on what product level do, do, do they had, what were their region in Spain, for example, uh, and being able to target those. So uh, for example, one of, the things that I, uh, one of the things that I did was that I asked a question. Uh, that email came up with a survey as well. And I, and I asked questions like, are you an iOS or an Android uh, user? Are you this or are you that? And, and that has helped me later uh, to be able to segment uh, the campaigns that I sent for them. Uh, okay, and um, just in a similar note, did you find that it was better for uh, retention of the customers or with, or did those become basically better customers? And I'm not sure if it's a, if it works for Idealista, but uh, did you find that there were basically better customers when they participated in your beta program? Uh, I've not tracked their performance individually in, in terms of saying have they done it or not. For one specific feature I did just because it was beta, so I was able to identify it anonymously, but I, I knew they were coming from there because I have a sign up specific for it. Uh, but what I have heard is that we do workshops all in Spain, in Italy, and Portugal as well. So I've heard the workshop managers, the ones that are doing the presentations and the workshop, saying like people approaching like, "Hey, I'm part of the beta program. You know, uh, I, I see that uh, before it had, it had launched." So mm -hmm. hearing about that feedback, uh, it's it's it really means that uh, it's taking part on the on the whole uh, appreciation and uh, hopefully in the fidelity of the of the customers as well. Okay, thanks. Um, tapping into that, um, those users, do you have, do they have any extra incentive besides being part of this beta program? Um, are you mixing different incentives? Are you segmenting? Are you, are you using gamification for it? What works better for them? Okay, does, does anybody heard the question? No, uh, she was asking me if I had any incentives for the guys in the beta program. And actually, no, we don't have any incentives. In the email that I show you, I tell them like, hey, there's, 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 no, there's nothing in terms of incentives. We're just going to, get to share you this and your insights will work on helping us uh, build this platform. And obviously, uh, that, that is because of the target that I choose to recruit. You're asking me where did I got them because the, I got them as active users I know that they were already engaging within the platform. So they were my users and is on their own interest to help me grow for them to empower themselves as, um, as users. If they were new users, if you were trying to attract new users, would you use a different approach? It's a, it's a great question and hard to answer because obviously it'll depend on the, on the product that, are, that you're working on. Uh, probably uh, I would. Uh, in terms of just having those people come on board to test. So you get a lot of things like coupons or stuff like that. I'm not really a fan of those because uh, what you end up is just having that coupon frenziness in terms of just looking for that discount and not actually having a real uh, interest in helping you grow. And that's the feedback that you probably are going to be getting is going to be different if you have incentives over there than if you don't. If you don't have incentives and people are sharing or talking because they are passionate about your product, you know that their feedback is going to probably be more real, uh, mm -hmm. more true to, to what they're looking, and not looking th that feedback based on an incentive they might get, or if they might not, if they say the, the, wrong, the wrong things. You're always skeptical mm -hmm. about getting feedback if, if you're getting paid. On the why part, you told us that, um, okay, I have an idea, so um, I Google it, nobody did it, great, niche, I will do it, but could it be that it's a bad sign that nobody did it before you? Yes, that, it, it's possible. Uh, does anybody heard the question? Uh, he was asking in the part of the why, let me go back to the, to the four questions. Okay, he was asking if when you're talking about the business context, 
if if you if you Google your your solution or your problem and you don't see any solution already out there, is that an indication that that probably is not a problem? And obviously the answer is hard, but for myself I would question if someone else has done it uh, previously. I'm a, I'm a very, uh, I really believe that most of the things have already been invented. Uh, and if not, it's probably someone out there in some part of the world uh, targeting that. So I'm, I'm, I'm mostly a fan of just uh, copying whatever others have done in the past in terms of already having proven it works or not. But it shouldn't discourage yourself because there's a lot of things, there's new technology coming up so there's niches uh, where you can find things that haven't been done before. Let's say cryptocurrencies, for example. It's a, it's a, it's a really a groundbreaking industry, or I know IoT as well, where you can probably didn't find something out there. But it's really important to, to find stuff like that. And uh, if someone has failed, it's even a better uh, validation on, on the direction that we're going, not necessarily on the solution, because many people have failed on the execution, not necessarily on the problem that we're targeting. Thank you. Sure. Okay, you, you talked about um, what a product manager has to, uh, has to provide. Uh, what are the, the outputs? And my question is, which, which are your inputs? Because at some point, for example, I have the impression that your function overlaps with marketing, with, uh, with sales, how, uh, how do you work with these people? Great, so we're talking about my inputs on what do I use in order to get context of the industry. Okay, so in, in ourselves and, and in our team, we have a stakeholder. So the stakeholder is usually something, someone not only with power within the organization that can help you uh, uh, keep out blocks, but should also be someone that knows the industry and that can help you, uh, guide you in the right direction. Not necessarily in the right direction, but should we have that experience in the industry that can help you uh, leverage on that. Uh, later, you have stuff like research that, that we do. Uh, we have a great team of UX. They have a great experience in terms of researching. So we rely a lot on that. Um, we rely on, on research not only in terms of, of, of data and what we put out in there and polls and surveys uh, using Hotjar and stuff like that, but uh, we're proud that we actually also go out and sit with them, talk with them, and get a lot of feedback back. Uh, so that's a, a second input uh, that, that we have. A third input that we have is data. So we have data within our databases, uh, data within our um, event tracking analytics, uh, traffic. But uh, we also try to put data in terms of, of the service that we do and in the KPIs that we have established. So we check those if they're correct or not. Uh, well, I told you about the beta program as well that, that we use as, as an input. And uh, basically what I try to do is have everything documented on a single place. Uh, either Jira, Confluence is better, having everything in there, labeling, using, using labels to be able to organize itself uh, as well. And uh, and we rely on, on the work that we do. I think that uh, at least on, on the different teams that we have, we have we do a little bit of, of each other. So as much as I'm the product manager, uh, our UX team also gets involved in the, in the product research. I also try to get in there, although it's not my best quality. Uh, but our tech team as well is really involved within the industry, so they not know a lot. And oh. Uh, I remember what, what I was going to say. Uh, I do once a month a meeting with sales, with support. Uh, we go as product, as UX, uh, as tech as well. And, and I just sit on a table and I try to do, first I just talk myself. On the first time I just talked about, hey, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing why. But at the end I understood that it was more important for me than, than for them at the end. So what I did was, let's say, like, hey, our meeting is changing. Like, I'm going to be talking 15 minutes, and then I'll shut up. And please do talk with me about the industry, about what our competitors are saying, about what our users are saying, and just give me feedback. Bring your homework. And I, and I, and I asked them to bring 
the homework and tell me stories what they're hearing what, what are they hearing in the market and it's really helped me also to try to stay as close as possible uh, with with users and with insights cool thanks sure if I understood well you design solutions by describing the pain of a of a user or a community of users. So this is kind of a broad question, but if you were to create a premium service, where do you draw the line or how do you uh, seek for the line in order to create two types of user or services, two versions of the same app or service? Great question. Um, so everybody heard the question, right? Okay, so how do you divide between the free version and paid version? How do you draw the line? It, it's, it's a really hard question. I'm not going not gonna to lie. Obviously, it depends on the product, on what you're doing, on the, your product life cycle as well. It's not the same selling you as a new guy, but selling as Ciderista, for example. So obviously, it's a, it's a, dif a difficult question to, to answer. I believe that um, you should serve a core, a core value to users. And that should be your free version. Your free version should always target what we're talking about, the context. And the premium version should go on added features that will increase your experience if you're going into that freemium model. So if you satisfy uh, basic users, and it depends obviously on your business model, uh, and you want to grow, grow them into premium uh, services, you just don't want to cut into features and just saying, no, you, you need the paid version of that. But it really needs to be understood from an investment perspective of yourself and your product that you need to step up in terms of your cost, in terms of what you're doing, in terms of your R&D. But it, it, it really needs to be transparent to your users that, that you're not charging them just because. And that's really hard. It's really hard because you really need to communicate well in terms of our premium features are this, and it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of R&D, takes more servers, whatever. So we justify that if you want that increased experience, you need to pay for it. So I have a question about the beta program again. Yeah. Uh, what are you actually sharing with the users? Is just screenshots, prototype, or is the actual product? All of them. Next question. No. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Uh, it, it depends. It depends. Uh, it depends on what do we want to test. Uh, if we are not really sure about what we're trying to do, if, if it is heading into the right direction in terms of, uh, of the user experience or the value that we want to we wanna serve, then we just send them a, basically a mock-up, as simple as possible, that communicates well uh, the, the value that we are proposing. And it's usually followed up by a survey, questions, or we even call themselves as well to see what they, what they think. Uh, but we have also have where we have the features already developed and it's ready to launch. We al always test with key features into going to a private beta and public beta. So private beta, we always give them the, the user's access. So you want to test this new feature? Cool, please accept. We'll send you the invitation. We will enable those features to you so you can test. And we usually take one, two, three, uh, one, two or three weeks just with this private beta before we go out to, hey, everybody, you want to test this new feature that we have in, in beta? Just go out and, and try it. So it really depends on, 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 on the uncertainty of what you're building. But we rely with themselves a lot. And as I told you, people are really eager to talk and help you. So. As, as much as possible, uh, th that you don't get unsubscribes. From your strategy structure, um, how does that evolve in the life of your development? Because uh, Y seems to be pretty static. Where may, might change? Uh, the other two would certainly change. I'm more interested also in the, the KPIs. Would, how would they evolve? I mean, yeah. In the life process of your design, how do you update that strategy? Great. So uh, as I told before, this should be checked uh, periodically. Okay. Either you're working quarterly or trimesterly or, or annually or whatever are your time frames within your organization. So uh, the why is the business context that usually doesn't change a lot. And if it did, it'll probably be a, a not such a big 
pain or need in the market. So it, it changes a, a few. And the, the where do we want to go changes a, a few as well. Maybe where, where it changes is in the initiatives that you do and the KPIs as well. Uh, before I was asked about the targets as well. So probably you're going to be moving targets until you uh, feel yourself uh, that you're satisfied for what that level is. And sometimes those questions uh, arise when you're reviewing this periodically. So for example, let's say, and I'm going back to the product dashboard, uh, let's say that uh, we have, um, and that, that should be red, <laughs> that's 10%, it's 8%, that should be red. Uh, if we have, for example, our churn in 5%, and we have 4%, and let's say we have that, we, we see that annually that churn has stabilized on 4%, and we are happy with that, then it's okay to leave it like, as it is. But let's say that we are a startup, or we are a really young company, and that we need to, to create value for future investors, so the growth part is really important. So maybe if we are hitting the 10% each month, we can challenge ourselves, can we get into 12? Can we get to 13? Or if we're satisfied with those, uh, those scores over there, we can add a second KPI, another initiative, and try to get those on, on green. Does that make sense? Yep. Thanks a lot for, for staying this time. And uh, hopefully it's something practical that you can apply for yourselves. And you learned something from here.